Welcome to The Big Unlock, where we discuss data, analytics, and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here's some of the most innovative thinkers in healthcare information technology talk about the digital transformation of healthcare and how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it's my real privilege and honor to have as my special guest today, John Scully, a former CEO of Apple. Uh, John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Patty. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, John, of course, uh, Apple needs no introduction, but uh, I was thinking maybe we could uh, we could start the conversation by, by asking you how you got involved in healthcare and uh, what are some of your current affiliations uh, in the healthcare space? It, it actually, Patty, goes back to uh, three months after I joined Apple. I was sitting around in the Macintosh engineering lab with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and they were talking about their noble cause to change the world one person at a time. Uh, Steve was gonna do it with a product that was to be called Macintosh that was designed for non-technical people to do amazing things. And Bill was doing it with shrink wrap software, something that was entirely new to the computer industry. And those words, noble cause, I'd never heard before in business. And they stuck with me over the years. And many decades later, uh, one of my close friends, Bob Metcalf, who uh, invented ethernet, said, John, people like you and me need to reinvent ourselves when we get older. And so I thought about it and said, I'm going to reinvent myself. This was 13 years ago around a noble cause. And so I picked healthcare, and I've been doing uh, helping entrepreneurs, founders uh, build uh, um, some very successful digital healthcare companies. We uh, built a company, uh, Grant Forsandig, who was the founder, uh, and, and I was his mentor. An investor, we built a company called Rally Health that we sold to United Healthcare, which is now the probably the largest, most successful consumer engagement uh, digital health company. Uh, right. I co-founded a company called Misfit Wearables, uh, which we sold to Fossil uh, about three years ago, uh, very successfully. And I'm uh, involved with MD Live, which is a telehealth uh, company. And I'm also um, part of the founding team and chairman of a company called. Rx Advance, which is a platform company in the prescription drug space called the PBM. And I'm also involved with a company called Zedson over in London, which has had a real breakthrough in terms of developing a sensor technology that can do non-invasive blood glucose monitoring that is as accurate as any true blood test. So these are all examples of companies that are disruptive, uh, doing exceptionally well, and I just feel very lucky to be a part of them. That's, that's just wonderful. So I will come back to the, the, uh, uh, to the concepts of disruption and uh, in a little bit, disruption, innovation in a little bit. Uh, let's talk about digital transformation, and you mentioned the digital health company that you founded and you sold to United Health, and of course United Health has been doing some very interesting things uh, in the market. As healthcare consumerism gains ground, uh, digital technologies are redefining the way uh, healthcare providers and the entire healthcare industry is relating to uh, consumers. But there seems to be a, a lack of a very clear definition around what digital transformation is all about and what, what it means. So it, in your mind, what does that term mean to you, digital transformation, and how do you see that playing out uh, in healthcare today? Well, I've been involved with uh, platform-based technology um, going back to the uh, days when I was at Apple. Uh, Apple was one of the first platform companies, and I've been in telecommunications with Metro PCS. I've been in uh, uh, financial services with Intralinks. I've been in uh, a number of other consumer companies like Hotwire and so forth from the earliest days. So platform technologies has revolutionized industry after industry with one big exception, healthcare. And the reason why it's been late to the party at healthcare is because the domain expertise of healthcare is so complex that the money that's being made in the healthcare industry is so significant that a lot of people don't want to rock the boat and their lobbyists there to kind of slow things down in terms of, of, of innovation and change. And it's an industry that's very highly regulated. If you make mistakes, you can you know, affect people's lives. So 
in, in, in uh, very serious ways. So for all these reasons, um, platforms are only just becoming to be significant in the healthcare industry. Platforms are uh, probably the greatest example of digital health uh, enablement. And um, I think we're going to see more and more success stories by 2020 and beyond uh, that will demonstrate that healthcare will be just as uh, important an opportunity for platform technologies as all of these other industries have been. Right. Uh, and, and my firm, I, you know, I run a growth and digital transformation advisory firm that focuses exclusively on healthcare. And I've been in the healthcare space for about 20 years. And my, in my work with uh, health systems uh, in general, you know, one of the things that I find is that healthcare is a very traditional industry, and I think you alluded to that uh, earlier comments. Uh, more importantly, from a platform standpoint, they are, especially health systems, they're dominated by electronic health record systems. We spend the better part of a decade and more digitizing patient medical records, and you know, tens and hundreds of millions have been spent on doing that. But now you have the big tech companies, uh, including Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. They're all making big investment, and they're trying to, you know, build these digital platforms of the future. Uh, my own sense is that, as you rightly said, it's it's in early stages. But what is the what are you seeing as the impact uh, of these companies coming into the market, uh, and you know, what's the kind of a time window we're looking at for them to really uh, become the, the de facto standards uh, in terms of the platforms for the future? Well, I think uh, it's, it's really becoming clear that Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google are all planning to move into the health industry in, in very major ways. Morgan Stanley estimated that by 2028 that Apple's health business could be as large as $300 billion a year. And Tim Cook has even come out and, and said that he believes that looking back decades from now, health will be the single biggest legacy for Apple. And they aren't really in the health industry beyond putting in you know, some um, sensor capabilities inside of the Apple Watch. So uh, this is going to be uh, require huge growth. Amazon uh, has already announced Alexa Health. Amazon has over 100 million Amazon Prime users who, if Amazon comes up with a uh, health uh, uh, service, and my guess is it will be a subscription service because so many uh, businesses that Amazon is doing are moving in that subscription service model, that um, Amazon has the um, talent and the capability to you know, build you know, major businesses in health. Their acquisition of PillPack is just one example of that. And then you look at, at uh, Google. Uh, Google, about eight months ago, uh, recruited David Feinberg, one of the most admired executives in the health industry, from Geisinger, to become CEO of Google Health. And no one is more advanced in machine learning and uh, artificial general intelligence than Google. So I would say look for them uh, to also be doing things with, for example, uh, if Amazon's going to have the Alexa Health, uh, voice assistant and tie that into uh, health services. Uh, it's realistic to expect that Google will be doing things in a similar way with a Google Assistant. So those are just a few examples of uh, what's possible. Uh, and as we all know, uh, those of us who have been around the uh, high tech industry for some time, there is no one uh, who has transformed uh, a large company so successfully as such a Nadella. At, at Microsoft in five years, uh, it's like a totally different company uh, in terms of culture, in terms of growth, in terms of innovation. So Microsoft also is going to be a big player in, in the future. The thing which I've learned, because I, I came out of big tech, but I've been in healthcare for 13 years. One of the things that, that really uh, captured my imagination is why I got involved with, with uh, a cloud-based PBM pharmacy benefit management company called RX Advance that was just beginning at, at the time I got involved is that a founder, Robbie Ica, pointed out to me, he said, John, by regulation, CMS requires that every prescription that is written um, must have documentation of the clinical uh, claims and related lab data. 
And he said, if you could take that data and not just use it to adjudicate reimbursements, which is the traditional role of PBMs, but if you could use that data uh, across the entire continuum of care, and particularly uh, get it to those chronic care patients with high comorbidities, as you know, Patty, about 5% of the U.S. population represents almost 50% of the $3.6 trillion health spend every year. And these patients are chronically ill. They're killing themselves and killing the healthcare system. And they very typically have nine high comorbidity diseases. But there are uh, many of these patients who are getting duplications of medication. They're getting side effects because different physicians don't know what other physicians are prescribing. And so the ability just to take that data, which the health plans have, not the electronic medical uh, records that are normally captured by Epic and and uh, Cerner and others uh, for the providers, but, this, but the data that the health plans have from their PBNs, you can get that data across the continuum of care, get it out to the physician specialist, get it all the way to the point of care, whether it's in the home or point of care at retail. Uh, you can dramatically change uh, the way we serve people, the costs of serving people, and particularly the most expensive patients, the chronically ill patients. So that's what got my attention. And that's just one, one example of a very large sector of the healthcare industry, uh, the prescription drug ecosystem. And um, you could find other examples, but, but that's one that, that really caught my attention several years ago when we were starting RX Advance. Right, right. And there is, uh, there is no dearth of uh, uh, disruptive ideas and innovation that is coming out of the tech industry in particular. Uh, at the same time, uh, some of the existing, the incumbents, if you will, are also reinventing themselves, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, and uh, non-traditional players are also entering the market. A couple that come to my mind are uh, obviously Walmart, uh, on the one hand, uh, trying to leverage their large retail footprint. But, you know, CVS today, just today, they announced these uh, health hubs. Uh, they're going to turn all of their clinics into some kind of a, uh, Quasi healthcare facility is what it. Is. So even the incumbents are reinventing themselves. So is there some kind of uh, uh, common ground where all of these models are going to converge, or do you think there's, you know, there's going to be multiple models in play in the foreseeable future? Well, first of all, uh, healthcare is not a winner-take-all industry. This is not like uh, Facebook. Uh, who dominates social media, or like Google that dominates his um, you know, search and advertising. Uh, this is a giant industry where there's plenty of room for many different uh, companies, whether they are incumbents with the examples you just gave, or whether they're high-tech um, innovator leaders who choose to come into this big industry, or whether they're brand new uh, startup companies like the ones I'm involved with. Uh, there are huge, huge opportunities, and that's why I'm quite optimistic, Patty, that all of these uh, players are going to be uh, making significant investments. Hopefully, some real innovation will come out of it. Uh, what we need in the healthcare industry are some role models. You know, we have great role models in all these other industries uh, that have adopted platforms and adopted, uh, you know, uh, business models that focus on the customer as opposed to the institutions still a relatively new idea in healthcare. And it's inevitable in my mind that we're going to have, as we move into the early 2020s and beyond, we're going to have a number of incredibly successful uh, new companies, much as we saw in, in e-commerce, social media, entertainment, telecommunications in prior decades. We're going to see that in healthcare in the 2020s. So I'm very, very optimistic. And I think it's not a winner-take-all industry. Uh, no one company is going to dominate us at $3.6 trillion industry. Right. I, and, and I tend to agree with that uh, as well. And now, you know, in healthcare, to be successful, one has to address the whole uh, reimbursement or payment model, if you will. And healthcare is used to a fee-for-service model for a really, a really long time. So for every kind of service has to be some kind of a medical code attached to it so you know health systems can get paid. Now, of course, the CMS and everyone else is trying to move the needle more towards a capitated model. 
but uh, all indications are that the progress there has been a little slower than what everyone expected it. So in an environment like this, when you know investment dollars are hard to come by, and uh, the investments have to be justified by some kind of a tangible return, uh, which is either through a reimbursement model or through some other self-funding model, if you will, these big platform companies, uh, do you think that their ability to make an uh, impact in the near term is going to be, you know, is going to be determined by? Uh, whether the reimbursement environment changes, or do you think that they're going to be successful no matter what? Well, you've d done an excellent job of uh, outlining the um, conditions that we have to deal with. Um, first of all, in 2014, when the Affordable Care Act was uh, launched, uh, all of the attention went towards the many, many mistakes that were made in its design. But in parallel to that, CMS started rolling out value-based care. And so now it's 2019, we're five years into it, and value-based care is starting to be better understood. People are thinking about how they can adapt, if they're already in the healthcare industry, their um, business models to be able to shift from fee-for-service to value-based care. There's no way we'll have a sustainable healthcare system for the nation over the decades ahead unless we can make that transition to value-based care. The value-based care model uh, creates a number of incentives. Uh, so there are HEDIS measurements, there are star rating bonuses, uh, there are other ways in which the health plans can earn uh, extra incentives for uh, having good patient outcomes, but there are also penalties. And probably the, the biggest penalty is if a chronic care patient is readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of discharge, it can be $10,000 a night penalty for the payers and providers. So there are big reasons why the healthcare industry, whether it's incumbents or new people coming in, uh, want to find ways to treat chronic care patients, not only with a better quality of life, which is going to be possible with, with uh, better technologies and innovation, but also with dramatically better outcomes in terms of keeping those seriously ill people from being readmitted back into the hospital. And just to put that into context, uh, it's estimated over the next five years, 40% of the hospital beds in America are gonna be eliminated. And what that means is that more and more of these uh, people who are chronically ill, who would have been treated in the hospital as an inpatient, uh, are going to be sent home, maybe after um, you know having a outpatient um, medical procedure, including surgery. So the ability to find ways to treat people remotely, and think what that means to an industry like telehealth. Now, telehealth, there's really only one success company in telehealth today, and that's Teladoc. Um, right. But it's an industry uh, that has largely been built around uh, low acuity care and low acuity care is for people who only need to have someone write a prescription because they've got the flu, let's say, uh, once a year, maybe twice a year. It's hard to build an industry around that. On the other hand, as this huge chronic care patient, aging society, people moving from hospital beds to being served in their own home, advancements in technology that enable remote patient monitoring, as these things start to gather scale, Something like telehealth, I believe, is going to pivot, and it's going to pivot towards higher acuity care. It's going to pivot towards uh, being more routine, where people who are not in, in a you know, good way to be able to um, go to a hospital, go to a doctor's office, uh, don't even necessarily have the money for the, for the transportation services, they're going to be served more and more in a combination of uh, in-person visits with doctors and nurses, but also remotely via telehealth. And, and that's going to be the sweet spot for telehealth. And it is very likely, in my opinion, that the big health insurers, the payers, uh, over the next several years are going to be uh, buying up the uh, telehealth companies that have built the uh, complex uh, infrastructure of how do you get doctors who can meet the uh, regulatory requirements and who are trained and who you have uh, have uh, the tools, usually platform tools. How do you get those uh, 
into a much bigger system where they can scale uh, maybe throughout a payer's network. Because the whole focus in the payer industry is to invest in ambulatory care. Part of that ambulatory care uh, includes telehealth. Right. And I think you make some very good points, especially about the uh, uh, overcapacity of uh, beds in hospitals. Uh, one of my guests on this podcast uh, a month ago was Dr. Toby Cosgrove, uh, and he he said that that is something that is you know he said the same thing he he just did, which is that this is unsustainable and and you know we are an overbedded healthcare system, especially at a, at a time when the trend is increasingly towards the virtualization of care. And you pointed to telehealth, which is just one of the modalities in which this virtualization is playing out. And there's some very interesting cases, uh, especially Intermountain Healthcare and Mark Harrison and the work that they're doing, especially around uh, advancing telehealth for rural care uh, in Utah. And so there's some very interesting uh, cases out there. Now, let me switch gears here a little bit, John, and ask you about the state of the digital health innovation uh, ecosystem. Now, you know, last year, uh, the numbers are that, you know, 8 billion, 10 billion, give or take, was invested in digital health startups. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these startups have come up with some very interesting ideas, but uh, a good many of them struggle to gain the traction that they need for a variety of reasons. And I, and I study that space very closely. There's a variety of reasons, but uh, the fact of the matter is that there is no dearth of innovation. People are coming up with smart ideas and smart companies. At the same time, uh, they're unable to sort of break through some kind of a barrier, uh, and very very few of them are actually pushing through to the other side, and you know, uh, and, and becoming uh, meaningful in size. Just a couple come to mind: Livongo, Health Catalyst. You know, those are the ones that are setting themselves up for IPO, maybe a Proteus. But the vast majority of them are not doing well, and. Uh, Firstly, do you agree with that assessment, and, and what, what do you think needs to happen for, for us to unleash and unlock that innovation in order to help healthcare in this transition towards the future? Well, um, I, I very definitely agree with your assessment, but let me give you an example from my own experience of uh, a digital health company that was started by a, a very talented uh, young uh, founder who, when I first met Grant for Sandik, he was uh, 21 years old. Uh, he, he dropped out of Brown University. And he had this vision of wanting to start a consumer engagement health tech company. And it was called Rally Health. And the, the thesis behind Rally Health uh, was that if you could get people engaged, at that time, there were other consumer engagement companies, but they were only getting single digit uh, adoption. Whereas with Rally Health, we introduced a health risk assessment model that was very simple, 40 screens uh, divided uh, A and B on either side of the screen, and we would ask 40 questions. Are you like this or are you like that? And by building up those answers for, to 40 questions, just looking at screens, we were able to get incredibly detailed digital profiles of the respondents. We used that data to self up, to set up self-organized uh, groups, these are women almost entirely. Uh, turns out women were the largest online gamers at that time because they liked Candy Crush, they liked Angry Bird, they liked uh, New York Times puzzles, you know, not video games, but you know, these types of uh, you know, skill games. And right. the result was that uh, when we went to United Healthcare, uh, we were talking to the Optum Group, they had a real problem making money with their preventative care and their wellness uh, patients. So as part of the transaction, they agreed to move 10 million preventative care patients from Optum, which uh, they were not making money on at that time, and another 10 million of their wellness patients they were not making money on at that time, over to our digital platform. We were one of the first digital platforms. Now I'm going back now um, almost five years. And we uh, worked with them to come up with a way to get uh, women who are the typical decider for their uh, families as to uh, what things they ought to do in care. We got the women excited about uh, ways in which they can modify their behavior and they could earn discounts on co-pays and deductibles. And because United Healthcare owns Optum, we were able to 
uh, much like frequent flyer miles for the airlines, we were able to come up with a program working with United Healthcare, which would lower the deductibles and the co-pays, uh, which meant for the health plans uh, improving their MLR, their medical loss ratio. And it turned out to be incredibly successful, very profitable. Uh, once United owned it, um, and Grant uh, for San Diego is still the CEO of that business, as well as the chief digital officer for United Healthcare, it, it turned out to be probably the best success story that I've seen in digital health. And we were lucky enough to have sold that company for over $2 billion. So uh, there are examples, but I, I tell you this story because there are a lot of things in this story that even if you are a talented digital health designer, if you don't understand MLR, medical loss ratio, if you don't understand reimbursements on uh, you know, how people get paid, how do you measure outcomes, if you don't understand the complexity of the health domain, you can't integrate at scale uh, the types of innovations I've just described with Rally Health. So I believe, Patty, that it's going to be a requirement that you have on your team, people who have deep domain expertise in healthcare, but also people who understand the advantages of platform technologies and particularly consumer engagement because the, the shift in power is going more and more towards the patient. Oh, that is that is a fantastic story, John. John, we just have a few minutes left, and I just wanted to ask you a, a really open-ended question to to round out this uh, this uh, fascinating conversation. If you were to look, uh, let's say, three to five years into the future, how, you know, who do you think are going to be the big dominant uh, you know players in the healthcare ecosystem of the future, especially from a technology-enabled uh, healthcare? Uh, delivery uh, kind of a, a, a scenario? Well, I'll, I'll just give you, uh, it's always easier to talk about things that I know about. Uh, so I'll, I'll take the example of, of what we're doing with a platform-based PBM. As you know, prescription drugs are under the spotlight for, um, you know, PBM as being middlemen who are very opaque. Uh, we need to have lower costs for prescription drugs. And um, everyone knows that the PBM system uh, needs major, major uh, improvements from an innovation standpoint. At RX Advance, our team had 16 years of experience building healthcare uh, platforms before we built uh, RX Advance. Uh, we did $10 billion of contracted revenue last year in our fifth year. Uh, we will easily double that in 2019. And our aspirations by the mid 2020s is that we can get to you know, somewhere between uh, 40 and $60 uh, billion dollars of contracted revenue. And all of this is being done with a platform technology. The thing that's, uh, I think, a, a, a real wake-up call for the PBM industry is if we had the amount of revenue that, let's say, Express Scripts has, uh, where they have 37,000 employees, with our platform, uh, we could serve that um, large volume of, of business with maybe a couple of thousand people. So 2,000 versus 36,000 people. Uh, we have no call centers. Everything is done through um, robotic process automation, you know, using machine learning. Uh, we are extremely accurate. Every time we deploy in a, a new market, we never have a hiccup. You know, it works perfectly the first time. And so these types of changes have got to be able to work at scale they have to be able to integrate into large uh, systems, large traditional organizations that already exist, and they have to do it uh, with no compromises. So it, it's a high bar to uh, meet, but it's very definitely achievable. Right. Well, all the very best uh, uh, for, for, the, for the mission of the company. I, I kind of took a look at the, the website. Seems to be a very interesting new model. And John, of course, uh, it's been fascinating to hear your thoughts on uh, on healthcare and technology in general, and uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Well, thanks for inviting me on, Patty. Uh, it's, it's been great fun, and, and you always attract interesting guests. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com.
and write to us at info at